Right here. Okay. Okay, everybody. Can you see Rachel on the screen? I'm just going to introduce okay. you who Rachel is. Dr. Rachel Lavmore Toenet Rabanit is the director of Aguno and Get Refusal Prevention Project the, of the International and Israel Movement in Israel and the Jewish Agency, assisting women and men with rabbinical courts to achieve divorce within Jewish law, educating towards and disseminating the halachic prenuptial agreement for the prevention of get refusal. As scholarly rabbinical court advocate, she's an expert in Jewish divorce law, specializing in the problem of aguno, which is chained women, unable to free themselves from their marriage. Dr. Levmore is one of a team that developed a prenuptial agreement for the prevention of get refusal, the agreement for mutual respect, as the first newly legislated female member of the State of Israel Commission for the Appointment of Rabbinical Court Judges, Dr. Levmore has participated together with the chief rabbis, ministers, high court judges, and MKs in the appointment of 32 rabbinical judges, 22 to the regional courts, and 10 to the high rabbinical rabbinic courts of appeals. An expert on the Aguna problem, she is the author of Spare Your Eyes, Eyes Tears, which is on prenuptial agreements, published in Hebrew. Dr. Levmore is a recipient of the prestigious Bane Zion Prize. She holds a PhD degree in Jewish law from Barlan University and writes lectures about halacha, women in halacha, and divorce in Jewish law in Israel and around the world, and has been very, very kind and generous with her time. Um, and she's here to tell us all about the prenuptial agree the post, -pre well, we're doing the post now, but, um, we are doing the post up to encourage everybody else to do a prenup and for the whole community at Y. And she's here to tell us um, more about it. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rachel Lavmore, for being with us. It's my pleasure. And I am very happy to see you. I, now I can see most of you uh, or all of you. And uh, that's, a, that's a good angle. And um, uh, I just want to give a uh, big yasher kochachech to Aliza for actually uh, persisting and uh, putting this evening together for you. It's an amazing uh, act that you are all about to go undertake. And I'm going to explain to you uh, what, what it is you're doing if you haven't realized it yourself already. Um, you've gone together as uh, several married couples. I understand that you're all related to each other. And uh, you're about to sign a postnuptial agreement in a halachic manner, a halachic agreement in a halachic manner, which comes to educate all those around you. In other words, first and foremost, your families, your children, the uh, larger family unit, your neighbors, and your friends. You're serving as a personal example, a dugma ishit, for others to show that uh, we have to solve in a halachic manner, a societal problem. The problem, unfortunately, is, is um, as it is today, in, according to Israeli law and also to, according to halacha all over the world, there is a problem and uh, it's based in uh, societal mores uh, and in the halacha. And we have found a way to have a, 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 to deal with this problem in a preventative manner. You're doing it in, also in a preventative manner, even though it's a post-nuptial agreement, and I'm going to explain. We have a document that's called, in Hebrew, the Haskem Lekavod Hadadi, and in English, the Agreement for Mutual Respect. This uh, document, this agreement, was drawn up by three people, in essence, in consultation with many, many other experts. The three people, two were Rabbanim, and one uh, was a uh, Tuan Rabbanit, myself. The two Rabbanim were Harav Eliashiv Kno, Zichrono Levracha, who, is the Rav, who was the Rav of Kibbutz Kfar Etzion, as well as other uh, positions that he held. And he's uh, the author of several books that the younger generation, the generation of our children, are using them uh, several books, outstanding books, two of them specifically. Uh, when uh, they get married, it's Ish Isha about uh, the laws of Harat and Mishpacha. He wrote that, and uh, that's what uh, our children are using. And there's another book that he wrote on Hilchot Kashrut, 
which is, again, speaks to the younger generation. It deals with all the questions that the younger generation meets up with that we didn't necessarily meet up with. We didn't travel to India or other places in the world that, uh, uh, you know, different questions arose. And he was very sensitive to the needs of the generation. Okay, so Rav Eliashiv Knoll and his Chavruta at the time, I'm talking about the late 1990s, um, if Rav David Ben Zazon, Rabbi Dr. David Ben Zazon, they were learning together and they realized that there is a problem. Oh, he, uh, rabbi uh, David Ben Zazon was at the time uh, the rabbi of kibbutz in uh, um, Turin. I was a Tawandit Rabbanit at the time, uh, developing prenuptial agreements for the prevention of get refusal. To me, it was a familiar concept because I'm American, as I understand all of you are. And uh, the Bethden of America, the Rinnacle Council of America, for decades has been uh, getting couples to sign on, the prenuptial, on a prenuptial agreement, which is nicknamed the Halachic Prenup. Uh, the two of them, uh, Rav Ben Zazon and Rav uh, Knoll, teamed up with me, and it took a long time. We developed the Heskem Lekavod Hadadi, which uh, has been uh, signed by thousands of couples in Israel since the year 2000 about. And we approached it in a very uh, interesting manner that we did not, uh, when you do something new in halacha, you, usually you go to the gdole hador, whoever they may be at the time, and uh, ask them to sign on. We uh, um, developed it uh, quietly in consultation with Dayanim and Dayanim from the, from the Beit Din Rabbani Agadol, and with uh, speaking to other big rabbis, but we first and foremost put it out for the people getting married to see if they would use it. With quiet, uh, uh, quiet um, approbations of different rabbanim, um, for example, Harav Shar Yeshuv Kon, then the chief rabbi of Haifa and the Av Beit Din, Rosh Avot Beit Din, in other words, the top Dayan in the Beit Din Rabbani in Haifa. Uh, he uh, had no problem saying it uh, out loud at the time. And slowly, um, it was a foreign concept to most rabbis. You know, your average rabbi that you meet going down the street, it was a foreign concept. And slowly, because of the groundswell of pressure from below, of couples that signed it for ideological reasons, which we're going to get to in a minute, uh, they began to accept it and to give their agreement. So just a few names I'm going to throw out uh, just to uh, make you feel good that you're doing something that's okay. And uh, you're sitting in Maldea Dumim. So Rav Nachum Rabinovich, gave his approbation. I was present at this meeting of uh, several Rabbanim and myself that we brought it to Rav Nachum Rabinovich, and he said, yes, it's a good thing, and it's uh, completely kosher. There's Rav Baruch Gigi, who's the Rosh Yeshiva in uh, Haritzion, uh, Rav Moshe, Rav Moshe, uh, uh, of course, Rav um, Ara Lichtenstein, Zichonol Lebracha, um, both his sons, Rav Moshe Lichtenstein, also Rosh Yeshiva in Haritzion, and his other son, Rav Meir Lichtenstein, uh, use it. Rav Meir Lichtenstein will, um, e e it uh, has every couple sign the Heskem Lukavot Hadadi. Okay, so let's move on and see what it says, what it does. It's simple. The bottom line is that money talks. In Kohelet, Kesef Yanet HaKol. This is a preventative solution to the problem of get refusal. And the problem of get refusal potentially can arise in each and every um, a gerushin, each and every divorce the, where the couple was married, Kedat Moshe Israel, whether you're in abroad in the diaspora or whether you're in the state of Israel. Now, we do have a Beit Din Rabbani in the state of Israel that has a, um, a jurisdiction over all Jews who are uh, um, residents or citizens of the state of Israel. Nevertheless, we have all heard horror stories, which are correct, 
of cases of get refusal that go on for years and years and uh, and the people become destitute because they're spending all their mother money on lawyers and the uh, woman's biological clock will just tick away. This is a problem for men and women in the state of Israel because neither a man nor a woman can uh, remarry without having a get from the partner. And when you want something desperately from someone, meaning acquiescence to give a get, then the person can name his price. As the more you want it, the higher the price, and he can just say no. So even the Beit Din Rabbani cannot solve that problem. They have powers, but in many cases, this can just go on for years and years as um, life goes by. We would like to protect all men and all women from this problem. The way we do it is that we have them sign the document which has a, a um, mutual obligation to a certain amount of money if there's, as long as they're married, Kedat Moshe Yisrael, and they have refused to arrange a get. It's a sophisticated document. It's a little bit lengthy and wordy because it, uh, it has inside it many halachic mechanisms that are like hidden, uh, or some are obvious and some are hidden, which guarantee that this is a um, halachic document. And uh, it's also a little bit wordy because it's also a legal document. Now, we'll continue. The a parallel obligation or the mutual obligation is one for spousal support which actually makes perfect sense. Because as married people, we know that um, we take care of each other. Whoever's working, and if both spouses are working, we take our money, and unless we've made other arrangements in a specific uh, financial agreement, we combine, we combine our salaries, and, it, and it, it provides us with our life's expenses, meaning, Half of my salary goes to my husband and half of my husband's salary goes to me. So in the document, it says that uh, the man and the woman both commit themselves to the same obligation, even though the wording is different. The wording is different because of halachic reason. But the practical result, the practical result is identical. Each one commits himself that if he is the cause of get refusal. He, is, he or she is the get refuser. The get refuser is maintaining the marriage. Kedat Moshev Yisrael. So as long as he or she is maintaining the marriage, he or she has to give up to half of his salary to the other spouse. Continue the spousal support. The amount is specified. The spousal support me, me, specified is $1,500 a month of spousal support or half of the person's income if it's more than uh, $3,000 a month, whichever is the higher, the higher amount. Half of the spouse's income or $1,500 a month. This has worked in Israel. There are numerous cases in Israel where a young man and in one case, I just heard it last week, I'll tell you in a minute, where, uh, where the young man, or not so young man, when his wife asked for a get, he said, no way, you'll never see a get. You're my wife, I'll never give you a get, and we would refuse to take um, any steps towards a get. Um, I will give you, bring two life examples that I know, I know about from close range, because I live in Efrat, and so far this agreement has saved three women in Efrat and one man. The man I just heard about uh, a week and a half ago, uh, my surprise. So I'll just tell you the story because you'll hear that there are people who say, for example, oh, it's not gonna work because what if somebody's poor? What if he doesn't have a penny to his name? So what does he care if he has to pay $1,500 a month? 
So here's a story. As we say in Hebrew, there was a young couple. He was 23, she was 21. Kipas Huga, she was from Ephrat. And uh, before they got married, uh, the mother took them and, and said, no wedding unless you sign this. They signed. They had the wedding. It was usual, full of simcha wedding. And um, life began. Very quickly, within a matter, I think, of two weeks, the young woman, 21 years old, she was in class with one of my daughters, 21 years old, found out that the young man she had married was not the man that she thought he was. He was, and I tell you the details only as far as I know. I, I, I'm telling you everything I know. I don't know the answer to the natural questions that pop up. But she found out that he was hundreds of shekels in debt, hundreds of thousands of shekels in debt. In other words, he had a debt of hundreds of thousands of shekels at the age of 23. I don't know how he got into that much debt, but he, not only did he not have a penny to his name, he had this enormous debt, right? He, he, she said to him in a very mature fashion, listen, we made a mistake. We have to separate. Uh, I'll go get a lawyer. You go get a lawyer. Let's, ha let's arrange a divorce. And he said, Lama, atishti, ma pitom? Ani lo aten lach get, ma pitom? She left him. She hired a lawyer. The lawyer called him and said, get yourself a lawyer. We're going to arrange for a divorce. And he said exactly the same thing. Ma pitom? She's my wife. I'm never going to give her a get. The lawyer said, come down to the, the woman's lawyer. The lawyer said, come down to my office. And he said, what for? In Hebrew, what for? I don't need to come to any lawyer. I'm not giving a get. The lawyer herself told me that she chased the guy down the main road of Efrat. It's like a main drag in Efrat. In Efrat. She chased him down with her car, she caught him and they stopped and she explained to him. She reminded him that he signed on the Heskem Lekabot Adadi and what did it say? That if he doesn't give a get within six months, he will have to give her a minimum of $1,500 a month for spousal support. Now, all of us normal people will say, what does he care? He's already hundreds of thousands of shekels in debt. So what does he care? Well, let's wait a minute. She explained it to him. And then she tells me, on the roof of her car, they signed a divorce agreement. A divorce agreement, very civil divorce agreement. Because there was no, there were no children. It was just, a, they were married a few weeks. No children, no, no, uh, uh, you know, communal property, a simple divorce agreement. He took, appointed her to represent him as well. And she went to the Beit Din and asked, opened a file, a joint request, a joint request for the arrangement of a get. We'll pause here for a minute and then we'll continue the story. Why do you think that he agreed when he heard that he's gonna, in six months time, he's gonna have to give her $1,500 a month until he gives her a gift. Why, why did he care about that? Anybody have any ideas? He didn't love her. Could be, could be, but then why didn't he give her a gift beforehand? If, he's, if he didn't love her beforehand, why didn't he agree to a gift? Maybe he married her for another reason, right? He didn't love her. Pay off the debt. <laughs> That's, I think that that's the case, that that's what he had in his mind. But even though, even though he still could have said, I have so much in debt, I'm never going to pay that. Why do I, why, why does it bother me to run into a higher debt? I'll tell you what I think. The signing of the Heskem Lekavod Hadadi flips the psychology of of a get refuser, of a potential get refuser. The psychology today 
if no, if, if somebody has not signed any sort of halachic prenuptial agreement for the prevention of get refusal, the situation today is very, a very Israeli situation. A, a woman asks a guy for a get, and the guy's friend who sits next to him in the minion, or the guy's mother, or the guy's lawyer, says to him, I'll to your friar. Don't be, be a friar. Don't be a sucker. You give, don't give her the get. See what you can get out of her. She owes you. The kids, the house, the dog, money, whatever. She owes you. Don't be a friar. What happens when you have the Heskem the Kavod Hadadi signed and he takes it to his lawyer or he understands himself that he's going to have to pay $1,500 a month after, after 180 days pass, and he still has to give it a get. He's gonna have to pay $1,500 a month for the rest of his life. He says to himself, or his lawyer will say to him, don't be a friar. What are you, an ATM machine? What are you, ataparashi tachlovotcha? You know, you're, she's gonna milk you for the money for the rest of your life? You're gonna have to pay her $1,500 a month? The psychology is flipped, Altia Fire. Now, getting back to this particular story, these, there are two things that were in, in place here, which gave him a kick in the pants that he realized while he was standing outside the lawyer's car, right? Which made him sign the agreement on the roof of the lawyer's car so that he's going to give the get. The first one is the Altia Fire, meaning, oh my God, she's going to milk me for $1,500 a month for the rest of my life. And the second one for this particular young man was, indeed, I am hundreds of thousands of shekel in debt. However, I can get out of this get debt, the $1,500 a month, even the first month, I'm going to get out of it before it falls on me. I have a mechanism how to get rid of it before it even falls on me. What's that mechanism? Give her a get. And then I'll get rid of, the, of this potential debt, which is everlasting. But I'll get rid of it just by giving her debt. I don't need more, more debt. And that's what happened. Now, I'm continuing the story to make an additional point. You may hear people that say, oh, the Beitin is against it. Oh, the Beitin will never arrange a get on the basis of, the, of, of a prenuptial agreement. Oh, the Beitin has, has ruled against it. None of that is true. The, even, even it, it, it's all a uh, hypothetical. Even learned that say that, they're not correct. Because experience has shown that in every case that a couple came to arrange a get and the Dayanim knew about the Heskem Lekovot Hadadi, a get has been arranged. And I'm going to tell you the end of this story and then tell you the other story that I just heard a week and a half ago. The, um, the, the couple came to the Beit Din, as I said, on the basis of a joint request to arrange a get. The Beit Din opened the session with the same question that they open every session because they have to check that the husband is giving the get out of his free will in order for it to be a kosher get, right? We're aware of that. That's what gives. That's what open. That's what opens the door to get refusal. Right. So they said to him, they opened. The, they said, Adoni, atamuchan latet get. You know, uh, sir, are you willing to give a get? And what was his answer? Can anina In other words, he admitted that the reason he's giving the get is because he signed on the heskem lekavod hadadi. What did the D Dayanim do? What did the Beit Din do? They didn't ask any more questions. They arranged the get on the spot. Now, why did they do that? I think that there are two reasons. I don't know if it was one reason or the other, or probably both reasons. Three reasons. <laughs> okay, three reasons. The first reason I alluded to beforehand, people who are evaluating whether what the Beit Din will do and is it a good thing or a bad thing, there are people that are against this because of 
um, of um, public policy reasons. They say, how can you talk about divorce when a couple's getting married? Or they fear that it will lead to easier divorce, which has also been proven to be, be wrong by, by decades of, 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 um, of experience in the United States, in the Beth Din of America, Rabbi Yona Reese, who is the director of the Beth Din of America and is now the director of the Chicago Rabbinical Council, has said in my presence, I heard it with my own ears several times when we lectured together, has said many times, they checked statistically the uh, divorce rate amongst couples who did not sign their halachic prenup and among couples who did sign their halachic prenup. And he said, the, the prenup does not raise and does not lower the divorce rate in Orthodox couples. People get divorced because of the reasons that people get divorced. They don't get divorced because they have a prenup. Okay, so getting back to the Beit Din, why did they arrange it on the spot? Is because this was not a lachatchila situation that they were being presented with. This was a bedievet situation. In other words, you can hypothesize and philosophize and, and talk about what's good and what's not good. All you want, it's easy to do when you don't have a case in front of you of a woman who is a victim of get refusal. They saw before them a real case, halacha lamaise, of a get refuser. They can size him up in five minutes and they can see that he's a potential get refuser. And if he opened the window, even a crack, and said, Rotsani, they will arrange the get right away because they don't want the woman to be in Aguna for the rest of her life. Another reason that they probably arranged the get on the spot is because they didn't want to get into the mess of examining a prenuptial agreement. And they, they didn't need to get into the mess of examining a prenuptial agreement to see whether they agree with it or didn't agree with it because he had it expressed his will. Okay, the second example that I give to you is um, I just heard that in Efrat, um, wait, in Efrat for a few years now, the Moetzat Datit in Efrat gives the Heskem Kovot Hadadi to every couple that registers for marriage and asks them to sign on it as a matter of course, as an automatic papers to fill out. They make sure that they understand it. It's accompanied by a letter that explains it. The letter was signed by four um, uh, individuals, rabbinic leaders. It was signed by Rav Shlomo Riskin, by Rav El Yeshiv Knol Zichron by uh, Rav uh, Baruch Gigi, and by myself. And couple sign it. What happened? A uh, young man from Efrat got married and uh, they signed it in the Moetza, in the Moetza Datit. And then uh, a short while later, he too realized that they were not a good match and that they have to get a, get a get. And he asked the young woman for a get, for a divorce, and she refused. He went to the Beit Din, he opened up a file, a unilateral suit for divorce, and the Beit Din called them in and then told the young woman and the young man, here is a date, you have to come for the Sidur get, to arrange the get. The Beit Din ruled. The young woman told her husband, told her husband in Hebrew, the way Israelis talk, he said, uh, um, I'm not agreeing to a get. I'm going to Canada. You can look for me at Ayichol Chapesotli. You can look for me in approximately 10 years if I come back from Canada in 10 years. He ran to the Beit Din. Oh, wait. He, he hired a lawyer. And in the lawyer asking him questions about the marriage and the wedding and everything, he asked him if he had a prenuptial agreement. And then the young man remembered that he had signed the Eskem Lekobot Adadi. So he went and he got the Eskem Lekobot Adadi. He ran to the Beit Din, told them that the woman is not agreeing to the get. She's going to Canada. And here is the prenuptial agreement that we signed, the Eskem Lekobot Adadi. The Beit Din called the young woman in earlier than the date that, 
that was set for the arrangement of the guests, called her in and said to her, At chayevet, you are obligated to agree to a get because of this document. And they arranged the get on the spot. So it works for women and it works for men and it works in the Beit Din. Bill, people are hesitant because it's not so easy to talk to couples uh, when they get, they're all, you know, looking through at the world through their rosy uh, colored glasses, rose colored glasses. And it's not so easy. So I'm not going to give you a whole talk now how to present it to a young couple because you have an article that I wrote, that I printed out, that uh, uh, Elisa printed out. Take it home and read it so that you too, you, by your very presence, you are becoming a shaliach for the dissemination of this um, uh, prenuptial agreement. And by your own example, you're signing it in postnuptial form to show them that you have beautiful, stable marriages. And this doesn't mean that you're afraid you're going to get divorced, but you're doing it for ideological reasons. You're doing it to prevent enormous tragedies in people's lives because everybody we don't know what the future holds. And people, many times people who refuse to give a get justify it to themselves. It's not, it's not crazy people all the time that refuse to give a get or people that have personality disorders. Regular people have fallen into the, into the abyss of refusing to give a get because the emotions kick in and they realize that they have the power to, to uh, and they justify it to themselves and they have the power to refuse. I have handled much too many cases of get refusal and have heard with my own ears how the people surrounding the get refuser, including his own parents and sisters, I'm thinking of a particular case, that they, they said, we don't know what got into him. We, we don't understand it, we're not that type of people. We would never do something like that. And yet their son and brother fell into it. So you're doing it to set an example. And um, I, you will soon, I hope, that you will have two kosher edim uh, coming in. And Aliza and John will explain the procedure to you. If, uh, if it's a, a little confusing, then you can read the, the instructions that I gave. And I, I uh, just want to tell you that um, you are taking place, taking a part in a historical development of halacha and doing it for the good of Am Yisrael. In America, they have had 100% success in all cases where the, their prenup was signed. In Israel, we don't have a central body that can give us these statistics, but of all the cases that have come to our attention, it has, again, been 100% successful. I will add one more point that's for, for, for your knowledge. That is that the prenuptial agreement can be signed with an international clause, with a bridge clause. You can get it from me. It's also on the IYIM site, or just call me. Uh, Aliza has my phone number and uh, email information. If you have any questions, or if a certain couple comes to your attention and you hesitate, you don't know exactly how to present it to them or to give them the information, feel very free to call me. And I recommend to every couple, whether they uh, have foreign citizenship or not, to sign the, prenup the same prenuptial agreement with an international bridge clause, which turns into the binding arbitration prenuptial agreement of the Beth Din of America of the RCA. Ayasha Koch to all of you. We hope that none of, you, none, none of the documents that you're signing will need to be put for use other for that. You pull it out of the drawer and you show it to your kids and you say, this is the minhag of our family. Abba and Ima signed, you're not gonna get married without signing it as well. And Read the article that I gave you. A big yasha koch to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rachel. You're very welcome.
Uh, I have a technical question before we hang up. Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm John. I'm John. I'm sorry. Reading <laughs> <laughs> on the um, when the when the, the the spouses sign or put their names on the top. What name is it? The the Jewish name. The two dots. Your, your legal name. Your legal name. Like in the two dots. So it's not on top. It's not Baruch Daniel Ben David. Whatever's no, on the no. But that's the agent right. have to sign that way though. The agent yes. Should sign how okay. have they right. called up for the Torah or by the two dots. Exactly. Which one? The Aiden signed like the way to uh, uh, call up to the Torah with their last name. Yeah, In other yeah. words, 